This is Conrad Nagel inviting you to stay tuned for the next half hour for one of radio's outstanding dramatic productions on Proudly We Hail. Proudly We Hail. And now another Proudly We Hail. One of radio's outstanding dramatic half-hours, transcribed coast to coast in cooperation with this station and presented by your Army and your Air Force. From Radio City, New York, here is your host and star on Proudly We Hail, the distinguished star of the theater, screen, radio, and television, Conrad Nagel. Thank you, Kenneth Banghart. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Proudly We Hail. Our play is entitled Terror at Polgar. The scene, mid-Europe. The time, well, it might be any time. The cast, a strange assortment of frightened people. The story, a tale of terror. Our first act curtain will rise after this very important message. The woman in the Air Force is a woman who has found that it's smart to serve her country. She wears the trim WAF uniform, and she has a good future and a good outfit. If you are between 18 and 34, go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and ask for details. Be smart. Do it now. And now with your star, Conrad Nagel, in the role of Edward Stanhope, your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Terror at Polgar. This is a tale that Satan might tell if he told tales, for it is a story guided by the bony hand of terror and shrouded in the black cloak of madness. If you would hear it, if you would realize that man is not all-knowing, but a puny instrument in the hands of forces over which he has no control, then, for although Stanhope is not Satan, he plays a principal role in this horrifying affair. There are things I remember about that first night, the most prominent being the disgusted knowledge that I was lost. I, who knew these wild moorlands as well as my native heath. There was no excuse for it. But somewhere in the gray autumnal dusk, I'd taken the wrong turn. And now as a witch's moon tore itself free from a ragged, tattered mass of racing clouds, I realized my surroundings were totally unfamiliar. The land, if possible, was wilder, banked with jagged, barren moors where nothing moved. Everything watched. Of course, a more practical man would have turned back and found the right track. Being in no particular hurry and of a stubborn nature, I reasoned the trail must lead to somewhere. So I continued on my way, even though the night chill cut through my heavy cloak with ease. I had just topped a small rise and seen the welcome lights of a village gleaming below when I heard the cry. <coughs> easy, girl. Easy, easy there cry like none I'd ever heard. A wild beast, surely. But I, who had hunted much, could not place it, and I must admit that in such solitary and foreboding surroundings, it startled me and thoroughly frightened my spirited horse. My hunting rifle was broken down and the saddle pack behind me. My only weapon was a revolver, which I carried as a precaution when traveling through such out-of-the-way places. But the moon blotted out again, and the darkness was intense. This time, the cry was much closer. Well, I'd always prided myself on my horsemanship, but Gypsy was gripped by a fear I could not control. She reared and shot off down the trail toward the distant lights. Gypsy, easy, girl, easy, it's all right. Well, perhaps she transmitted her fear to me. But when it came again, this time just behind us, I did not try to hold her, but gave her a head and let her run shot through a rent in the clouds, and I looked back toward where we'd been. The trail was empty, but a great clump of bushes by its side seemed to be trembling wildly with more than the force of the wind. Good evening. Well, what is it? What are you staring at? Uh, I, I beg pardon, mein Herr. You, you came in so quickly, you... 
Startled. Hmm, yeah. You have accommodations? Oh, yes, my dear. And someone to see to my horse? At once, my dear. Anna, call Hans. There is a horse to be looked to. <sighs> this fire helps. What town is this? A Polgar, my dear. A... You became lost? Polgar. Where is that? I'm on my way to Klagenfurt. Klagenfurt? At least 20 kilometers. No. <laughs> That's what I get for coming across the moors after dark. Across the moors? <laughs> my hair jokes. Well, my hair does not joke, and my hair is hungry and thirsty. Well, what's the matter? It, it is dangerous to be on the moors when the light is gone. Indeed it is. There are goblins there, aren't there, Bozoy? Uh, my name is Linton. How do you do? How do you ever come to this out-of-the-way place? How do you do? Oh, um, this is my sister, Judith. How do you do? My name is Edward Stanhope. How do you do, sir? English? Welsh. With a name like that? <laughs> yes, with a name like that. <laughs> but I always say that... It... <laughs> do leave a cut. What are you crossing yourself for? What is that animal, anyway? Bozoy's goblin. What was it? A wolf? Not... Not an animal, not a human. It's something from heaven. What are you talking about? <laughs> Look at him. He's, he's turned green and he's shaking like a leaf. Laugh if you like, my head. But when you learn what that cry means, you too will shake with fear. But tired as I was, sleep would not come. I lay in my bed listening to the wind beat against the inn, my mind playing back the scenes of the evening. Poor Zoe, his ruddy, round face, gray with fear, mumbling rubbish about werewolves and legends of old. Linton, thin and aristocratic, making fun of the innkeeper. But all the same, listening for the cry to sound again. And Judith, his sister, fair and lovely, saying nothing. Her wide, gray eyes studying me intently as I told what had happened to me on the moors. Later, some of the town people had come in, and in their guttural patois, which I could not understand, they'd talk excitedly to Borzoi and his silent but obviously terrified wife. Whatever this thing was that gave vent to such an unearthly cry, the people of Polgar did not take it lightly. Their village was far off the beaten track, and their superstitions were deep and rooted in the dim past. Linton laughed at their fears, and I, too, should have taken them with ease. Still, I had heard the cry close by, and as Borzoi had said, it sounded like something from hell. Finally, I fell into a troubled sleep, deciding that in the morning I would organize a hunt and get to the bottom of this business before going on my way. Hey, good morning, Herr Borzoi. Did you sleep well? No, I slept not at all. This, this animal, or whatever it is, why are you so afraid of it? Have you ever seen a man with his throat torn out? Huh? Yeah, bad as that? Three years ago, we heard it in the night. The next day, they brought in Tavo. He was a farmer. It was horrible. Butcher. What did you do? We hunted during the day for a week. We found nothing. Did you use hounds? The hounds would not hunt. Have you ever seen a hound that would not hunt? They knew. Well, what happened then? Nothing, nothing until last night. Now, now it will happen again. Whatever this animal is, it can be caught. I've done a lot of hunting. You can gather some of your friends, I'll lead them. Otherwise, I'll have a look by myself. Admirable, but I'm afraid a great waste of time and energy. Oh? Uh, Herr Stanhope, this is uh, uh, Dr. Hovey. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, sir? Dr. Manfred Hovick. Please forgive my rudeness, but I could not help overhearing you as I came down the stairs. Hey, you tell him, Doctor. He will listen to you. <laughs> I, too, have done much hunting. And I happened to be here when the unfortunate incident occurred three years ago. I assure you, our hunt was thorough. And we found nothing at all. Well, is that any reason not to try again now that this thing has returned? Not at all. It would be good exercise. I may even join you in this book. Um, who is he? He is Dr. Hovick. He comes every summer and stays until the first snow. A very learned man. Oh, there, Stano. Nelly Riser. Well, I thought I might go goblin hunting. Capital idea. May I join you? Of course. I thought you might want to. Oh, no. What's this all about? What's this loss? Oh, no, son. It's lost. 
Du lieber Gott. What did he say, ma'am? They, they found Tavo's son. His throat has been torn now. All the rest of that day, until darkness fell, Linton, myself, and everyone in the town who could hunted the moors. The hounds did not hunt. They would not hunt. They went wild with fear when we brought them to Tavo's farmhouse on the edge of the village. But as the learned Dr. Manfred Hovick had predicted, we found nothing, absolutely nothing. As darkness fell, you could feel a blanket of fear settling in over the village with it. All doors would be bolted this night, and no one would venture outside under any circumstances. Linton, his sister, and the doctor and I had our dinner before the fireplace, a silent, shaken borzoi attending us. What do you think it can be, Stanhope? A wolf. There are no wolves in these parts, Stanhope. And wolves travel in packs. Yes, I know that, Doctor. But have you ever heard of the lone wolf, a wolf that travels alone, bigger and more vicious than the rest? And who once every three years pays a visit to Paul Gar, huh? Perhaps you have a better explanation, Doctor. I might, my dear, but it would sound fantastic to you. Oh, now, you're not going to tell us it's one of old Borzoi's uh, werewolves. And what is a werewolf, sir? A chap uh, possessed by demons turns into a wolf or some such nonsense. Mm, that's not quite right. Lycanthropy is a form of madness in which the victim believes he is a wolf, and so assumes the characteristic of one. Oh, rot. You really think so? I certainly do. This is a small village, and anyone going around thinking he was a wolf would be noticed quick enough. Ah, oh, but this is a madness that only possesses its victim at certain times. Otherwise, it's perfectly normal. And you're saying that's what we've got here? No, I do not. But I say it's a possibility, because I believe anything is possible. Yeah, well, that's very broad-minded of you. But you seem to scoff the idea of a perfectly logical explanation. A man with his throat ripped off is not so... Some... Yes, I suggest we change the subject. I beg your pardon, Miss Lincoln. The whole thing reminds me of a play that I saw in... Well, that night, the wind banging a shutter woke me out of a deep sleep. Yeah, I lay for a moment orienting myself and realized gratefully that it was the shutter in one of my windows that was making the racket. I got out of bed... Across the moonlit room. When I was done, I stood for a moment, looking out at the scene before me. There was a smell of snow in the air. A great bank of clouds is racing in from the east to blot out the moon. The land looked naked and cruel in the moon's cold white glow, the moors crouching above the village. As I started to close the window, my eye caught a movement at the building's edge. The wind was blowing, certainly, but it was not choppy. Yet the thick vines that grew in profusion on the walls were trembling there unnaturally. From where I stood, what was causing the vines to shake was not in my vision. But as I watched, and the shaking continued, mounting upward, a fearful conviction seized me. Someone was climbing the far in wall. I ran to the bed, grabbed my revolver from under the pillow, and then I raced down the hall. For I knew Judith Linton's room was the destination of the climber. Miss Linton! Miss Linton! Open the door. Open the door quickly. It's Edward Stanhope. Miss Linton, wake up. Wake up. Uh, who is it? What do you want? Please, please, Miss Linton, open the door at once. What do you want? Open the door. Get out of the way. What? Look. Look there. Oh! Conrad Nagel, starring in the role of Edward Stanhope in the proudly we hail production Terror at Polgar, will return in just a moment for the second act. Who's the smartest woman of the year? Why, the woman who puts on that new blue uniform of the United States Air Force. Smartly tailored and neatly groomed, she's being seen more and more around the nation these days. She's smart in another way, too. She started a great career as a WAF, one of the women in the Air Force working side by side with the men of the Air Force. She wears her Air Force blue proudly with a sense of personal accomplishment because she's doing a needed job in administration, in radio as a technician or operator, in the medical service as a technician, or in hundreds of other interesting fields. More and more young women, 18 to 34, are finding out that the smart thing to do is to get the complete details at the nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station to put on the smart blue uniform worn by the women in the Air Force. How about you? Can you qualify? You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now with your star, Conrad Nagel, in the role of Edward Stanhope, we present the second act of Terror at Polga. Do you 
is like snow. Yes, winter comes early to these parts. Hadn't we better turn back? It'll be dark soon. Oh, you're getting cold? Oh, no, the exercise has kept me warm. I've enjoyed it very much. I... Well, you're so kind. Oh, nonsense. I'm lucky, that's all. Well, how do you mean? Well, I have such a lovely companion riding with me. Well, I'm lucky, too. But you're a light sleeper. Now, you must try to put that from your mind. Oh, how can I? If you had not been awake and seen that... Look, ma- it won't happen again. Well, I'll not sleep soundly until we're back in England. You're leaving Friday? Today, if I had my way, but Richard must have time to finish his painting. Yes, you have a very talented brother, if I'm any judge. <laughs> he showed me some of his work, you know. He's captured the stark beauty of these moors. Not just their look, but, you know, their, their feeling. Do you go with him on all these trips? Oh, no, this is the first. It's been a delightful summer and fall, up until last night. Miss Linton, Judith. You know, I'd feel much better calling you Judith, if you don't mind. Oh, I, I don't mind. Edward. <laughs> All afternoon, you've been trying to steer my thoughts and our conversation away from what happened last night. I want to talk about it for a moment. Is that all right? Certainly. Do... Do you have any idea who or or what it was that was trying to break into my room? We don't know who it was, Judith. Because I didn't name well. But we do know it was a man. But how do you know that, really? I trust my eyesight. Although I didn't get a very good look at him last night, even in the darkness, I could see his shape. And if that isn't enough, there were footprints below your window. I know, but... Well, I can't help remembering what Dr. Hobick said. A form of insanity that makes a man think he's a wolf. Judith, did you ever hear of a wolf who could climb a wall? No. An animal killed both Tavo and his son. A four-footed animal. Whoever decided to break into your room last night took advantage of the fear this animal has created. He'd like us to think there was a connection between himself and the killing. But... But then he must be mad, too. Could have been a thief, you know, who didn't realize your room was occupied. I don't think you believe that. Well, Judith, regardless of what I think, I assure you, you can sleep in safety as long as you're here. Forewarned is forearmed. Borzoi is seeing to it that the inn will be under watch until we get to the bottom of this. Do you know what I believe? Regardless of your logic and your attempts to assure me, that whatever it was that killed that poor Tavo boy would have killed me, too, if it hadn't been for you. Judith... If I believe that, I think I'd tell you. But there's one reason above all others that makes me sure there's no connection. Three years ago, this wolf, well, let's call it a wolf, came here. It stayed for one night, made its kill, and went on. Two nights ago, it came again. Now, on both occasions, its cry was heard by everyone in these parts. Last night, there was no cry. You didn't hear it. No one else did either. Now, assuming that our wolf is a madman and still amongst us, stands to reason he would have been heard last night as well. I imagine if there is such a thing as a man thinking he's a wolf, he'd have to sound like one. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? Well, it seems to. What does Dr. Hovick think? Well, Dr. Hovick is so full of his own knowledge that I haven't bothered to ask him. <laughs> and anyone who could sleep through last night's proceedings is a dullard in my book anyway. <laughs> you don't like him very much, do you? After all, Richard didn't wake up until Bozoy came running upstairs. Well, I don't know about your brother, Bozoy, but I do know that Dr. Hovick, with his fine black beard and close-cropped hair, seems to be an authority on everything known to man and God. <laughs> I have never taken to authorities. <laughs> look, look, you can just see the village. So, so the good doctor has left our midst. Yes, my dear. It was very sudden. A letter came, and he said he must be in Vienna by next week. We shall miss the learned gentleman. Always he has waited before for the snow. No, I don't think he missed it by much. Tonight there is no wind. There will be fog. The fog is bad. It hides. Ah, good night for goblins, eh, Bozoi? It is not a joking matter. Uh, Dinner will be served in half an hour. Well, I'm for bed. <laughs> I suppose you two would like to be left alone anyway, can't say as I blame you. Mm, you're so tactful, Richard. The very soul of discretion once when I was... Oh, no. Seems as though we were wrong, eh, Stano? Excuse me. Where are you going? I'm going hunting. Care to come along, Linton? Brother? No, you can't go out there. It'll kill you. The, the both of you. Bozoi, Bozoi, come in here. Judith, Bozoi will take care of it till we get back. I'd stay down here by the fire. Try not to worry. We'll be all right. Please. Please, it's madness to go out there now. You don't... Oh. 
Get your gun, Linton. All right, Linton. I think this is far enough. Whatever it is we're hunting is out for the kill. We've got to assume that. Also, that it's cunning and won't stumble into a trap. This fog doesn't help. Treacherous. Yes, what breeze there is is coming from up there off the moors. If, if it's up there, it'll catch the scent of whichever one of us is closest to it. If it's below, the same applies. You want to separate? Yes, but not far. Look, I'll move up the trail by that clump of bushes there. You stay here. Mm-hmm. If the fog grows no thicker, we'll be able to keep each other in sight. Uh, we, uh, we play bait for each other, eh? Well, something like that. To your game. <laughs> A Linton is always game. Providing he doesn't become game for the wolves. As Linton and I sat in our respective positions, time lost all meaning. We were caught in a fog-shrouded limbo in which the cold quickly numbed the hands and feet. While the deadly peril we faced put a ball of ice in the stomach and made the heart beat like a tom-tom. Although the moon's rays could not actually penetrate the fog, they gave it an unearthly glow, improving our vision, but at the same time lending a more awesome aspect to the scene. Bait. Bait in the trap we were, waiting for what I know not. As the cold grew more intense, the fog thickened, and what breeze there was seemed to fade away altogether. Linton's body became a formless outline. Still, we remained as we were, unmoving, waiting. We had not heard the cry since we left the inn. And with so much territory for the creature to roam in, I realized our chances of bagging it were very slim indeed. And then it happened, as a breath of wind sprang up and tore a ragged rent in the curtain of fog swirling about my companion. Behind you, Linton! Look out! <laughs> me up a bit. What in the name of Satan was it? Here. Here, let me have a look at you. Oh. I messed up your arm and your chest. Listen, do you think you can make it back to the inn? Aren't you coming? I hit it. I hit it, Linton. I'm sure I did. I'm going after it. The wind is coming up. It'll blow this fog away. Well, did, did you see what it was? Here, let me help you up. Uh, now, you can get back to the inn. Yeah. I take you back, but I don't think there's a moment to lose. Oh, I'll make it all right. Thanks for saving my life. First Judith, now me. Well, you'll have to become a part of the family. Be careful, stand up. The breeze dispelled the fog quickly. Even so, it would not have been difficult to follow the trail. The earth was hard packed, and the blood lay on it in an ugly, thin line that led me upwards and onto the moors. I knew it must be heading for the swamp where it could take cover in the wild bracken. When it cried out, I stopped still. My eyes searching, and then I saw it. Dark, hideous form loping in a disjointed gate close to the ground. The moon's rays caught it for an instant. As it passed over the ridge line of the hill, I felt the hair tighten on my scalp. And I ran on. I ran on all the harder. When I reached the top of the hill, it was lying there in wait. Some instinct had warned me to go cautiously so I was not taken completely by surprise. better? Oh, much. Judith's a good nurse. <laughs> I, uh, I came to say goodbye. You're leaving so soon? Yes, I must. You know, I hope to visit you both in London as soon as my business permits. <laughs> Make myself scarce. Uh, did, um, did they recover the... No. No, it fell into the quicksand below the hill. We can be thankful for that. Stand up, it... It wasn't a four-legged wolf, was it? Well, why do you say that? I didn't get a good look at it when it jumped me, but 
I never knew a wolf that wore a suit of clothes. Hmm. They must never know that here. And you must never tell Judith. I have no fear. Well, sir, Dr. Hovick was right, eh? Yes, Linton. He was right. Horribly right. What? Who was it, then? Need you ask that, Linton? Oh, no. Yes. I mean that Dr. Manfred Hovick will never return to foul the moors of Polgar again. And may the good Lord have mercy on his soul. He was the wolf, Linton. He was the wolf. Our star, Conrad Nagel, will return in just a moment with a word about next week's show. Registered nurses, the United States Air Force Medical Service offers you a great opportunity to serve your country and further your own career. Yes, you can become a commissioned officer. You receive postgraduate training in anesthesia, operating room management and techniques, nursing administration, and other related fields. Nurses with special qualifications may train as flight nurses at the famous Air Force School of Aviation Medicine. For complete information, write to the Surgeon General, United States Air Force, Washington 25, D.C. I'll repeat that address. The Surgeon General, United States Air Force, Washington 25, D.C. Do it now. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. Proudly We Hail stars Conrad Nagel. Terror at Polgar was written by DeWitt Kopp. This program was produced under the supervision of Charles and Rogers Productions and directed by Charles Wilkes. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking, and here again is your host and star, Conrad Nagel. Friends, we hope you'll accept our invitation to join us for Proudly We Hail over this same station next week. Our play, our play is entitled Folk Tale. It's a story of early America. I know you won't want to miss it. So until then, goodbye. Goodbye.